Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. It's an amazing place to be as a forensic scientist to be in such a diverse group. Um, so thank you for um, coming and I hope that what I'm able to share with you this morning is of interest to you. I think it, what I'm hoping is there'll be a number of themes here that will really resonate with you in your individual disciplines and what I'm hoping is it might be possible to start some conversations. So as Katakani said, I'm, I'm in forensic science. I look after forensic science at UCL. Um, we're in a very, very interesting space. Um, there are studies out there which would suggest that you lose between 50 and 100 hairs every single day, and a pretty incredible 30 to 40,000 skin cells every single hour. So it might not surprise you if I told you that when you get up from that seat later this afternoon, it is quite possible that you may well have left a hair, maybe a fibre from your jacket, even your DNA on that seat. And the person that sits on that seat next, they, they could well pick up that hair, that DNA. Now, ordinarily, of course, that is not a problem. Unless, of course, that person goes on to commit a crime, leaves a trace of you at the crime scene, and then you become the crime suspect. Not all of us are going to commit a crime. But every single one of us could be accused of one. So you're in the court. Imagine that you're standing in the court. And the expert is explained to the judge how that hair, how your DNA is cast iron proof of your guilt. But you know you're innocent, and in that moment you've got this rather uneasy feeling that it's you versus science. Now you might be thinking at this point, now surely that's exactly what forensic science is for. Isn't that what we see on shows like CSI? Um, silent witness, you've got the crack team of scientists, they've got the latest tech in the lab, they follow the evidence, identify the suspect, and then they close the case. What shows like, friends, it's, uh, like CSI are really good at showing us is the capabilities of the technology that we've got now. And it's utterly remarkable. But what they're not so good at showing us is the biggest and really most challenging challenge we're facing in forensic science. Forensic science is, without a doubt, a technological success story. We've got, the we've got the capabilities now to identify smaller and smaller amounts of trace. We can do it more and more accurately, and we can do it quicker than we've ever been able to do before, which is really important in forensic science. You've only got to be in this room for a minute speaking, and the technology is now sensitive enough to pick up your DNA from that seat or the table in front of you. The problem that we've got, though, in forensic science is a big one. We don't have the data that we need to be able to always understand and always to be able to interpret what that evidence means when we find it. And that's a big deal. So how big a deal is it actually turns out rather a tricky question. It's something that the group that I lead at UCL has been looking into, and we did a study that came out last year that looked at the Court of Appeal in the UK. So this is a very, so obviously the Court of Appeal only sees a small fraction of the number of cases that are uh, heard across the country. But in that study, um, between 2010 and 2016, we identified um, just under 1,000 cases where criminal evidence was absolutely critical. And in 22% of them, the evidence had been misinterpreted in the original trial. If we go a bit more broad, there was a study that came out of the US um, that the FBI did in 2015, and they looked at hair evidence. They wanted to look at cases where hair evidence had incriminated the suspect. And they had 268 of those cases. What they found when they looked into those cases was that in 257 of them, erroneous statements were made about the, the hair. So that's 96%. In 96% of those cases, the hair evidence was misinterpreted. And just to underline what that really means in real life, 35 of those cases, the suspect got the death penalty. What that 96% is telling us is that we've got a problem in forensic science that technological fixes alone aren't going to fix. And what that 96% is telling us is that we've got a problem that it could affect me or could affect you if you're caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. But more than that, it's if your DNA or your hair turns up in the wrong place at the wrong time. We are experts at identifying what a trace is, whether that's gunshot residue, whether it's trace DNA. 
But to address this problem of misinterpreted evidence, we need to know what it means. So if we find gunshot residue on you or your DNA on a gun, we don't, it's not enough for us to know that it is gunshot residue or it is your DNA. We need to know, did you fire the gun? And if you did, was it this morning or was it yesterday? Or was it last week? This all came home for me a number of years ago when I was working through a particular case file. It was a, it was a murder case. And as I was going through it, it became really clear that there was absolutely critical forensic evidence in that case, and the whole case rested on it. They'd found these trace metallic particles um, on the victim and also in the suspect's vehicle. An assumption was made about those particles. It all really revolved around how and when those particles had transferred onto the victim. But those assumptions were presented as a fact in court, and then the fact led to a conviction of two men for a crime that they hadn't committed. So misinterpretation is the biggest challenge facing forensic science, and it's the biggest challenge because it has real-world impact. And we need a solution. So this is exactly what we're focusing on in the research that we're doing um, within the team that I lead at UCL. We want to do the studies that will produce the data that we need to, to begin to answer these questions around what does the evidence mean when we find it. And we've got two areas that we're really looking at around that. The first one is what we're calling trace evidence dynamics. So if we've got physical evidence, how and when is it transferring? Because if we want to know what it means, we need to know the answers to those questions. So we've done a whole range of studies. We're looking at a whole range of different types of evidence. But one that I think is a rather nice example is a study that we've done recently on gunshot residue. So we got a volunteer to fire a gun. You know, don't say academics, don't get have any fun. Um, the volunteer fired the gun. They then shook hands with, the, with a colleague of theirs, and then the colleague got on with their day-to-day -day activities. And what we were able to observe was that that colleague, so the one who hadn't fired a gun, had gunshot residue on him. But it was more than that. He was able to transfer that residue onto other people and onto other things. So we're observing that gunshot residue can transfer directly, but it, it can also transfer indirectly. And that's rather important to know when you're doing a forensic reconstruction. We're also looking at DNA, trace DNA. How does that transfer? When does it move? And given what we all now know about quite how many skin cells we've been shedding over the last five minutes, it won't surprise you if I tell you that if somebody uses a knife, we can almost always detect their DNA on that knife. But what the studies we're doing are showing is that it is also possible for somebody to use that knife but transfer your DNA onto that knife. So that's a knife with your DNA on it, but you've never touched it. And that's a really important distinction if we want to know what that evidence means. So the second area of research that we're looking at is um, the human factors. What is going on to influence the critical decisions that are made um, at those critical points in a forensic reconstruction from either the crime scene, um, in the lab, when we're analysing the data, what, on interpreting what it means, or in the court at, at the end of the process. There's a lot of literature out there that shows just how sensitive human decision makers are to external influences, external factors. But a critical question for forensic science is, does the context that the scientist is exposed to at the beginning of a, pro of a reconstruction, so at the crime scene, have an impact on the decisions that they make later down the line, and ultimately, does it affect what they understand the evidence to mean? So we did a study to check that out, and we set up a, a mock crime scene. It was a grave site. And in that study, we had very clearly male skeletons, and they were buried in clothing, along with some other artefacts like coins and mobile phones, contact lenses, the sort of thing you often find in graves. And then we got our participants to come and excavate the graves, recover the human remains, bring those remains back to the lab. Our first group of participants who had to do that were asked to excavate graves where the, the clearly male skeleton had been dressed in female clothing. And then the second group had to excavate the grave where they had the male skeleton but dressed in neutral clothing. So they excavated the graves, they recovered the, the skeletal remains and they brought them back to the lab and we asked them to lay out the skeletal remains in the lab. At that point, we asked them to do um, to perform a sex estimation. It's a very standard process. 
And this is when we started getting some quite interesting findings. So the first group, so these are the guys who had excavated the, the grave where the male skeleton was dressed in female clothing. And in that group, one person said that the male skeleton was male. Two said that it was possibly male. Five said it was indeterminate. They couldn't say whether it was male or female. And three said that these skeletal remains were possibly female. So that, that got us thinking. The second group, so these are the guys who had excavated the skeletal remains in neutral clothing. Seven of them said these skeletal remains are male. Two said they were possibly male, one said indeterminate. So already we're seeing quite a big difference between those two groups. Um, far fewer said indeterminate, nobody said possibly female. We also had a third group. So these participants just saw the skeletal remains in the lab. And we asked them to do exactly the same thing as the previous two groups and to perform a sex estimation of those remains. And what we observed in that study was that every single person in that group said that the remains were male. So context does appear to have an influence, and we're calling this cascade bias, <coughs> which we think is happening in quite a lot of the different processes in forensic science, where initial context is having an impact on decisions that are made later down the line, and ultimately affecting what we understand the evidence to mean. So these kinds of studies are incredibly important because they produce really interesting data, but they're also um, beginning to provide data that can help us understand what's going on in terms of interpreting what evidence means in a specific context. But we're thinking about impact, we're thinking about how does this kind of research actually have traction in the real world. So just to illustrate why I think this form of study is so important and why we need to actually be enabling it to happen, let me take you back to that case I mentioned at the beginning where um, we had those trace particles where that became critical. Um, they were on the victim in the suspect's vehicle. <coughs> in that case, there were two assumptions made about those trace particles. The first was how and when did they transfer onto the victim? And the second was how rare are those particles? And it's those two assumptions that really illustrate the two aspects of the challenge we're facing in forensic science about interpreting what the evidence means. So these are the particles. Um, you can see um, the scale bar there, so it's 50 microns. The hair on your head is about 60 microns. So we've, we're seeing microscopic particles. Two or three of them will fit within a hair's width. And they're made of rare earth elements, and that we it was discovered that they were produced every time you use a disposable cigarette lighter, so you know the one with the little wheel that produces a flame. And we had, um, we had 13 of these on the victim and five in the suspect's vehicle. When the scientists identified these particles, they hadn't ever seen them before. They're made of rare earth elements, and it was assumed that they were rare. They also observed their, their, their shape. They're very small, very rounded, um, it was assumed they would fall off clothing if they were transferred onto clothing very quickly, a matter of minutes. So we had a very small number of very rare particles that were in common between the victim and the, and the vehicle seat that are likely to fall off very quickly once they're transferred. And that led to the conclusion that the victim must have been sitting in the vehicle very shortly before death. So we needed to test both of those assumptions. The first test we did was about around how, how rare are these particles, how, common, how, many, how many particles do you get when you use a disposable cigarette lighter. It had been said in court, you get a few. We did a whole range of different cigarette lighters, we did a whole range of replicates, I got ridiculous vistas on my thumbs, but I can tell you that as a result of that, when you flick a lighter, on average, you're getting about 4,000 particles when you, when you flick a lighter. The second aspect was... Um, how quickly do they fall off clothing? So is there a period of time, um, is that period of time that they inferred a correct one? And again, we did a whole range of studies, different fabrics, different particles, um, and over a wide range of different times, after seconds, minutes, multiple minutes, hours. At 18 hours, we still had a lot of particles on the clothing. So we were able to provide data that indicated we don't get a lot of these particles falling off very quickly. So... What those experiments were able to show is that the evidence in the original trial wasn't nearly as strong as had been originally thought. The particles aren't rare. We're getting thousands of them. They don't fall off quickly. They stay on for hours, 18 hours at least. That dramatically changed the significance of those particles. 
It meant that there was a lot of other places and a lot of other times when they could have transferred onto the victim. And seven years after the original conviction, having been in prison, those convictions were quashed. This kind of, de this kind of experiment matters because it has impact in the real world. So at the moment, forensic science isn't always the open and shut case that we sometimes are led to believe that it is. It is possible that we can find your DNA on clothing at a crime scene that you've never worn. It is possible you could test positive for explosive residue going through an airport scanner, having got a, a taxi to the airport and managing to pick up something in that taxi. But at the moment, we don't have the data that we need to always understand how and when that's happening. And that means that forensic science evidence isn't always going to be interpreted accurately. So we need, we need some changes, and this is how I think we're going to get this kind of change into, into policy and into real-world solutions. We need to change our focus from being primarily on technological developments to understand what something is. We need to understand better how and when trace materials are transferring. We need to understand much better what's going on in the critical decision-making um, at the various stages in a forensic reconstruction, what's influencing how, and to what degree is that affecting what we understand the evidence to mean. For that to happen, though, we need something even bigger. We need a massive change in the culture and in the environment. At the moment, this kind of research is not valued and it's not enabled. So we need to create a change to an environment where that is happening, where, that, where we can enable this kind of research. And we need to do that, because if we can we've got a chance to dramatically reduce the chances of forensic science evidence being misinterpreted.